My name is Jared. I'm with Next Generation Trust Services, and presenting with me today is Nicholas Timpanaro. Nicholas started his career in the title industry in 1986 as a title abstractor in Hunsett County. In 1990, he was hired as a chief title examiner and manager of the foreclosure department at First Financial Title Insurance Company. In 1994, he became president of Commerce Title Agency, and in 2000, he opened Fortune Title Agency, Inc., and expanded the business to not only perform mortgage foreclosures, but also tax foreclosures, REO property sales, purchases, and refinances. So thank you for coming along on board with us today, Nick. You're welcome. So let me, let me, we're, today we're discussing tax sale foreclosures. How and why did you get involved in this area? I don't know why. Um, well, when I started working with a title company, I got involved with bank foreclosures. And um, working with the bank foreclosures, uh, the same attorneys would be working with tax sale foreclosures. So it was basically the same animal. Um, I got involved with doing that. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a difference with them, and uh, a lot of the underwriters are not comfortable with tax sale foreclosures, and um, I'm one of the few uh, title agents that deal with them. Uh, it's lucrative. I can, I can make money with them, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> we, we like that. Thank, thanks, Nicholas. We look forward to hearing the presentation coming up. But for right now, I'm going to give a brief rundown on self-directed retirement plans, which allow you to purchase tax liens using qualified funds. Again, my name is Jared with Next Generation Trust Services. If you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to chat them into the chat box, and I will try to take them as they come in or at the very end of my presentation. I may take all of them at that point as well. So the easiest way to get started is what is Next Generation Trust Services? We are an administrator for self-directed retirement plans. Our clients are investing in non-traditional assets. So typically with your retirement plan, you're investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs, with big banks like Fidelity or Charles Schwab. Our clients are looking into non-traditional assets, things like real estate, tax liens, precious metals. However, we're not a bank and we're not a financial planning uh, service company. So. The funds are not held here. They're held with a custodial bank that hires us to do the administrative work on the self-directed end. So people come up to me and they say, Jared, what should I invest in? We can't help them with that either. As I mentioned, we're not a financial planning service. We can never, ever really endorse or recommend anything. The plan is called self-directed, and the plan is self-directed. It's completely up to you on what you want to invest in. We also don't review the merits or legitimacy of any investment. If you're recommended to Next Generation by a third party, it is very important that you know that we do not endorse or work with any company. There are several types of plans that can be self-directed. There is the retirement end, which is traditional IRA. That's for tax-deferred investing, the tax write-off in the current tax year. However, presumably at retirement age, when you are at a lower income, you will be paying the taxes on your distribution at that point. A Roth IRA is for tax-free investing, which we love. Basically, you are paying the taxes in the current tax year, but all of your assets and your earnings are 100% percent completely tax-free from there on out. So what I like to say is if I start a retirement plan, a rough retirement plan, and contribute $5,000 in this year, and I come out with $5 million when I'm retirement age, I made a few good investments, and it's all tax-free. The SEP IRA is for self-employed individuals. This is similar to the traditional IRA where it's tax-deferred investing. However, the contribution limit on a SEP IRA is much, much higher. 
currently in this year, 2012, the contribution limit for a set plan is $49,000, up to $49,000, I should say. While a traditional IRA, you're only eligible to contribute $5,000 per tax year. A simple IRA is for small businesses. Some employer plans, such as a 401k plan, can be self-directed. It's very rare that you find that with big companies. However, if you are looking to establish a 401k plan, that plan can have a self-directed portion. There are other plans that are not to do with retirement. That's the Coverdell Education Plan. This is to save for a child's education. And it doesn't need to be college. It can go to private school, high school, books, room and board. Anything that has to do with an education can be uh, paid for by a Coverdell plan. And that plan, when you make contributions to it, that plan can be self-directed. The last one is the health savings account. This is for medical expenses, and it is a plan that you do need to qualify for. It's for high deductible uh, plans only. And the beauty of it is you put money into a health savings account, you're not paying taxes, and you take the money out of the health savings account, and it is the only plan where you are not paying taxes. It's a write-off um, when you put it in, and you are not paying taxes when it comes out. It's the only plan, but again, you do need to qualify for that. Is only for high deductible plans. There are several ways to fund your self-directed IRA account. The first one is a contribution. I mentioned a little bit about contribution limits before, but that is the money that you are eligible to put in in each tax year. So the contribution limit for 2012 to a traditional on a Roth is $5,000. And if you're over the age of 50, you're eligible to contribute an extra $1,000 as a catch-up to, to help you catch up on your retirement savings. Most clients that uh, do want to self-direct have some sort of IRA or old 401k, and they want to either transfer or roll over those funds. A transfer is between like accounts, so if you have a traditional IRA with one of those bigger banks doing traditional investing, and you want to transfer some of those funds uh, to your traditional IRA here, you can absolutely do that. Again, as I mentioned, the rollover is from between unlike plans. So if you have a old 401k from a job that you recently left, and that's sitting there doing nothing, you can roll that over into a self-directed IRA. What we're seeing now a lot is a conversion. These are people who, because of the recession, are making a little less money now, but they're willing to convert their traditional IRA, which is tax deferred, into a Roth IRA, paying the taxes on those funds now, just so any assets and any earnings that they have from here on out are completely tax-free. And that is called the conversion. Now that we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is investments, we're going to go over the things that you cannot invest in, and it is a very short list. You cannot invest in life insurance, and you cannot invest in collectibles. Collectibles, things like art, wine, stamps, baseball cards, cannot be held within your retirement plan. The other restriction is dealings with disqualified persons. These people cannot have any interaction or any personal gains from the assets that you are holding in your retirement plan. So to break that down a little simpler, say you own a condo in your retirement plan. The people who are on the list of disqualified persons cannot live in that condo even if it's at a fair market rate, cannot provide any service to that condo. The list of disqualified persons are the IRA holder themselves, their spouse, any ascendants, any descendants and their spouses, fiduciaries to the account, business partners, are all disqualified. Again, another example. 
to own a property with your retirement plan. Your father's contracting company cannot do the, the construction work on that property, even if it's at a fair market rate. Again, that's any ascendants, any descendants of their spouses, the IRA holder or the IRA holder's spouse are all disqualified. So what are the investments people are making? People are investing in real estate, all types of real estate, tax liens, which we're going to get into later, mortgage notes, people are loaning money out using their retirement plan funds, which is an allowable investment. People are investing in precious metals, international real estate, hedge funds, LLCs. You are allowed to invest in LLCs. A number of our clients, they invest in a company that trades and sells wine. Now, if you remember, I talked about collectibles. You are not allowed to hold wine in your retirement plan. However, these clients are investing in a company that trades and sells wine, which is, which is an allowable investment. But we're going to get into tax liens a little further, uh, a little later. I'll let Nicholas talk about that. But with real estate, again, you can invest in apartment buildings, commercial real estate. You can invest in single-family homes, condos, any type of real estate you can think of, you can invest in your retirement plan. But, again, it cannot have any dealings with the disqualified persons that I mentioned. So with the real estate market being so down at this point, a lot of people are looking to jump on board into real estate. So let me give you an example of how it would work to invest in real estate with your retirement plan. The, the first step that actually isn't listed on there is to open your account with a custodian or administrator like Next Generation Trust Services and fund that with at least enough for a good faith deposit. At that point, you can go and you can locate your investment property as you would outside of your IRA. But when you're going to negotiate that purchase contract, it's not Jared Lopez's IRA. Uh, it's not Jared Lopez that is signing uh, the contract. It would be the name of your IRA. And the name of that IRA would be Next Generation TS, which stands for Trust Services, for the benefit of the client name and then the IRA account number. Once the contract is approved, you submit that contract to Next Generation with the deposit instructions. We execute the contract and send out the deposit from the money that we have in your account, in your IRA account. You do the due diligence on the house, home inspection, title search, anything you need, but it needs to be paid out of the IRA. So all of the, your due diligence, once it's under contract in your IRA, needs to be paid out of your IRA. So you're, you're looking to close. You submit the closing documents with the instructions for payment to Next Generation Trust Services, and we fund the escrow, and then your IRA is the owner of the property. Any invoices, any rental income you receive, all, has to pull, all flows through Next Generation Trust Services because it is with your retirement plan funds. That's just a very brief breakdown of how it works here. I'm going to give you my contact information. The phone number here is 973-533-1880. And you can email info, that's I-N-F-O, at nextgenerationtrust.com with any questions that you have. I'm going to wait one minute to uh, see if anyone has any questions. You can please chat them in the chat box right now. And I'll leave my contact information up, and then we'll get into the tax sale foreclosure process with Nicholas. So does anyone have any questions? The, the question that came in, what if you already own the property? If you personally own the property, you are unable to sell that 
to your retirement plan, even if it's at a fair market rate. So basically, the properties that you own are disqualified from being held in your retirement plan. It needs to be a brand new, not connected to you personally, investment. Great. Uh, uh, okay, hold on, one more question. Oh, we have a couple more questions. Hold on. Good. <laughs> If it was purchased through an LLC that you are a part of, that, that property, even if you're a part, a partial owner in that LLC, you are still disqualified from holding that in your retirement plan. And if you have any further questions to follow up on that, I don't want to get too involved in it, but if you have any further follow-up questions, please give the office a call after the presentation. I'd definitely love to, to talk this out with you. The other question is, please discuss next generation fee structure for the uh, self-directed IRA with real estate. When opening the account, there's a $50 account setup fee. That's to set up the account, move the funds in from uh, via transfer or rollover. Then once you um, have that, you will also be charged an annual fee. If you're looking to purchase real estate, usually the best fee structure for you uh, we do have two fee structures, but usually the best fee structure for you is a $325 per asset per year. If you own one piece of property through your retirement plan, that would be considered one asset. That would be $325 annually. There is a $100 purchase fee for any investment that you make, and then funding the, uh, the investment. So it's either a $5 check fee or a $30 wire fee to send the funds out to make your investment. So I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm going to hand it off to Nicholas uh, at Fortune Title Agency. Nick, I'm going to try to, to follow along with you uh, in order to change the slides. So, um, again, if, if I'm falling behind, just let me know to, to change the slides. And, everybody, thank you for, for listening. This is Nicholas. Okay. Yeah, look, my alarm went off. Sorry. Um, hello, everyone. I hope everybody's uh, having a good day. My name is Nick Tipinero. Um I am the owner of Fortune Title. Uh, we deal a lot with mortgage foreclosures and tax sale foreclosures. Today we're going to talk about tax sale foreclosures, basically how they work and um, where they go for. Um, <clears throat> we can go to the next slide, Jared, if you can hear me. Um, of course, I'm not seeing it, but that's okay. I'll just go from where I am. Um, we have uh, tax liens and, and what they are and where they come from. Um, each town collects taxes. Uh, they're paid on a quarterly basis. And um, we need to uh, pay them, otherwise the town doesn't get their money to run their budget. So what the town does in order to uh, facilitate their budget, usually in November or so, they'll uh, put together the uh, delinquent properties and uh, sell them for taxes, and that's where the investors come in and would buy them. <clears throat> if anybody gets the Star Ledger, um, if they look at today's Star Ledger, on page 62 starts a listing of tax sales um, for the city of Newark. And, and it continues, uh, I actually have it here, to page 66. Um, there's about two, four, six, eight, maybe 1,500 uh, properties that are going up for tax sale. Tells you the uh, time that it goes up, um, which for this one will be Friday, November 9th of uh, 2012. Um, Jared, I don't, I don't know if you can move slides. I'm, I'm uh, basically, I'm probably on slide four, which says, auction information. Um, 
so this is like one point of where you can get your information from as to what tax sales are coming up for any particular town. Uh, you can also call the tax collectors um, because they will um, give you the information of what's going on. But for the most part, they are posted. Uh, they have to post them. Uh, it has to give the individual or the owners the chance to pay them off, settle them out before the auction comes. Um, in, in the article itself, or in the notice itself, it tells you how to bid, tells you what you need to bid. Um, the most you can get for a tax sale would be 18% back on your money. Uh, but you would need certified funds in order to buy these things. And then there are penalties if you don't pay the money after the bidding is done. So, uh, you know, you have to pay attention to what you've got. But uh, the point is, once you find that there are um, tax sales available, you should do your due diligence. I mean, there's 1,500 properties in North that are coming up for tax sale. Uh, it would be nice to uh, look at them and figure out if you, if you have an idea of the area of which ones you want. Some of them are a bit ridiculous. Uh, there is one in here that uh, just caught my eye. Uh, if you have the star ledger, it's on, on, on page 62. It's about 15, 20 down, but the the amount due on it is $3,584,486.18. Uh, that's one hell of an investment. <laughs> if, if you're trying to buy that, you're going to come up with that for the town. <laughs> and that would be the price that you're going to pay. Um, or you're going to start the bidding on, and the bidding in itself is a process. Um, they will be usually held at the town municipal court, and um, what happens is you tend to bid on interest rates. So you know the amount of the judgment, and you're willing to pay that judgment um, with an 18% bid, and from that point on, whoever else is bidding against you uh, will lower the interest rate as it goes, even to a point where um, we would be uh, paying a premium. Okay? Um, so basically, I'm just going to recap and back up a little bit uh, just to get to where we are so I can keep the uh, thoughts going. We start with that the taxes are due and paid, uh, and they're not paid, so the town creates a time that they're going to sell the taxes to you. They put it in the paper, or you call the uh, tax collector, and you get the information as to where we are, uh, where the property is. You do your due diligence. Now you go to the auction um, because you want to use this as an investment. You will bid on it. Um, there will probably be a lot of people there bidding. Uh, if any of you are doing this already, you, you, sometimes you walk into the room and a conversation goes on because you know everybody in there. Uh, who's looking for what property and what bid? And sometimes there's backroom deals that go on to decide that, uh, look, I won't bid on this property if you don't bid on this property because we know that you want this property and I want this property and we'll help each other out this way. Um, there have been other kind of backroom deals going on, but I don't think I should get into those. Uh, <laughs> and we'll move forward. Once once you win your bid and you uh, acquire your tax sale that you decided you wanted or you won, you really need to um, get this thing on record. Okay? So, um, once you receive it, you have three months, really, to get it recorded. Failure to record it uh, could result in a, in a problem uh, later on down the line. Um, once you own it, the town should contact you for subsequent taxes that are due on that certificate. Um, and, and it's not always just the municipal taxes. Sometimes it's sewer, uh, sewer sometimes it's water. Um, the listings will tell you exactly what they are. I think if you... Uh, Look at the, if you do have the star ledger and you look at it, it, it lists the uh, blocks a lot, the location, the name of the owner, um, the taxes that are due, the water, the sewer, any other, um, what the interest would be and what the cost would be for your uh, for you to purchase everything. So 
uh, you'll see everything laid out right in front of you. Um, now that you uh, own it and you're getting notified for the subsequent taxes, uh, your obligation, really, if you want to make money with these things, is to maintain that. You don't want anyone to buy newer taxes on you. So, uh, in other words, if I picked up the taxes from 2011 and they still weren't paid in 2012 and another sale comes up, I want that certificate. I don't even want to go to sale. I want to pay those subsequent to protect myself. If someone buys a newer tax sale because uh, – You've allowed them to get uh, to not be paid, so they went to sale again, and they won that bid. Their certificate has a priority over yours, so they can basically foreclose your interest out, where you would get nothing. Um, so you want to protect that interest if you're looking to make money. Um, <clears throat> you need to hold on to the tax sale for a period of two years. So whatever investment you're making. I mean, some of these things you can buy for a couple hundred dollars, but then as the taxes go on and they're not paying them, you're going to need to keep them up. So you, you've got to figure you're going to need a minimum of two years' worth of paying the taxes uh, before you can foreclose on that. So it's not a short-term investment. It's something that takes a little while. But um, the people who have been doing this, um, once you start, after two years, you tend to uh, just – foreclose one right after the other because you've been paying attention and buying one every year. Okay. Hi, um, Nicholas? Yes. Before, before we move on, we have a we have a question. He, someone is a little confused about what you mean on, when you're bidding on the interest rate starting at 18% and bidding down. They ask, aren't you bidding to buy that receivable? Okay. Yes, you are. Uh, you are bidding, but your bidding starts at 18%. It's, a, it's an odd type of bid. You're not bidding numbers up. You're bidding interest down. I want that thing. I want it at 18%. If I can get it at 18% and no one's going to uh, – 18% of, of the amount of the judgment, that's what you're going to make on your money. Okay? So if you're, if you're buying for $100, you're going to say, oh, I'll give you the $100. I want 18% on my money. Next guy says, I'll give you the $100, but I'll only take 16%. And so on. And so I'll give you the 100, I'll take 15%. Until someone gets to the point where they're, they're saying, okay, I, I need to make 12% on my money. I don't want to make less than that, so I'm not going to bid anymore. The guy who has it down at 12% is there, and you'll get the certificate. And for that amount of money that you're putting out, you're going to get 12% on. Um, the subsequent taxes that you pay uh, afterwards, which, which come to you, after the certificate, so the next quarter that's due and the next quarter that's due, those quarters you can get your 18% on. <clears throat> there are points in the bidding war where it comes down to uh, 0%, and I'm willing to pay a premium in order to take the certificate because I want this property. I think that what's due on it is worth it and that by paying my subsequent taxes for the next two years, I'll still end up making money. Uh, so it's, it's like a math game that you're going to play and, and decide if you want to pay more than it's worth in order to gain the interest on the subsequent stuff that's going to happen. Um, so the, what the total outcome you're looking for uh, is to get your judgment with your interest, and you know, the good possibility is towards the end of this, when we get it there, uh, you could acquire the property, which then, once you own that, then there's more than 18% that's going to be paid. Um, so, so you're you're purchasing the tax sale at a price, and then you your first bid would be 18% of that uh, of that total cost of this certificate, and yeah, you'd be making an interest payment, uh, or you would be receiving an interest payment of 18% annually um, based on the certificate that you buy. Yeah, you're And then it goes right? down from there. Yeah. Okay. So you're not receiving any money until you foreclose the property. So for the first two years, you're spending money. Um, <clears throat> the most interest you can get is 18%. So when they do bid, that's where they start at. They do start and say, well, you know, I'll take it for 18%. And if somebody's willing to take it for less, that's where the bidding comes because they want that property. The subsequent stuff you will get 18% on. And after the two years come and you go to foreclose, and, uh, which we'll get into, but when you do foreclose the property, you set a time, place, and the amount. 
the amount that is set for uh, the judgment is the initial amount you paid, the percentage on that initial amount, the um, subsequent amount you paid, the 18% on that subsequent amount, the cost that you expelled for your legal cost in order to go forward with the foreclosure, because a uh, majority of people will go to a firm like Taylor and Chrysler, and uh, they'll do the foreclosure, so they're paying them, let's like, say, $1,500 to do the foreclosure, uh, where they're going to do all the filings, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But then when the time and the place comes, that's when the owner or the institutional lender has the right to pay that judgment. If they don't pay it to you at that time, you acquire the property by final judgment, which is going to be worth or should be worth a lot more than what your judgment is. Okay, but if they do pay it, you're going to get your investment back with all the interest and costs that were out there. I, I hope I answered that question enough. Now, um, I like to do I, it I have, Nick, Nicholas, I have a few more, I have a couple more questions. I don't want anyone to fall behind. Do you mind if I give you those couple right now? Go right ahead. Okay, so uh, another question that came in. After you buy a certificate, if you pay the subsequent taxes, do you automatically receive a certificate? No, there, there is no new certificate because the, the, they're not being sold. You're paying them. But it's being added to the amount of your certificate. So when they when they go in for a redemption on that certificate, so let's just say that, that the town decides or the people who own the property that didn't pay their taxes, uh, that you bought the certificate on and you paid the subsequent taxes, now for some reason they're selling the property. What will happen is uh, the buyer will come back to the town to find out, and the seller, how much do they owe to get rid of your certificate to pay. At that point, um, listed on your certificate, kept in records with the town, are um, – the original amount that you pay for your certificate and any subsequent amount. So the, the town turns around and they have to issue the um, payoff statement to the seller or buyer stating that, well, you paid $100 for the certificate. It's been out there for a year and a half at 18%. And during that year and a half, you paid uh, you know, $100 each quarter at 18%. And they calculate what's the total judgment there. So when that certificate gets redeemed by the seller or the buyer, you're going to get your money back plus all your interest, and you're done. They redeem the certificate. Does that answer your question? I believe so. We'll see if we have a follow-up question, but uh, a separate question. Do you get to pay the subsequent taxes, or do you have to wait to see if the homeowner pays them, them first? Um once the subsequent taxes become due, if they're not paid, the township um, should notify you before they go to another sale that there's taxes due. Because township wants their money. You're the certificate holder, and before they go through the process of doing another sale, they would rather just give you a contact and say, um, you know, first quarter was due. It's late. It's now the second quarter. They didn't pay the first quarter. Do you want to pick up the first quarter? Or they might wait until, and I'm not exactly how each town will work it, but uh, they will usually notify you before they resell the taxes again, giving you the opportunity to uh, buy those subsequent taxes without it having to go to sale and you having to go bid on it. I think. Oh, okay. One more. One more. Uh, so basically, the investor steps into the shoes of the town, correct? Uh, and then the town, uh, and then the owner owes you instead of the town. So the owner can pay the current taxes and not pay you for the back taxes. Is that how uh, it yeah. works? That can happen. Yes, it can. You picked up the taxes for that period. But um, again, once they go to sell the property, or they go to refi the property, as long as your lien's on record, uh, it's a lien against the property. So no one's going to give them a mortgage, and no one's going to buy the property without paying your certificate. So you can hold a certificate. A lot of these smaller certificates are water and sewer, and sometimes the people don't even realize that 
they've gone into tax sale. Like they didn't pay the water bill, so they went up to sale, so they paid it. Um, now, uh, when they go to sell the property or do something, they find out about it. So it's like, okay, you know, it gets paid. You make your money, you walk away. It's a, it's a, it's a little uh, shorter time investment, but uh, for the most part, even you can contact the owner and try to get them to pay it. All right, Nicholas, thank you for taking those questions. Please proceed. Okay. So now I'm going into the procedures of uh, uh, tax sale foreclosure. So um, um, what, we, what we do is once we're ready to foreclose, uh, and we've held a certificate for two years, um, I find it would be a lot easier to use a firm or attorney that's familiar with doing it, let them file all the paperwork and, and get it done. But the procedure is you have to do a notice of intention um, where you're going to notice the person that they are going to be foreclosed, there's X amount of due on it, and if they want to avoid uh, the foreclosure going through to final judgment, that here's the amount due. So it would be your judgment and all the interest and everything figured out to the bottom line of how much you're going to want. Um, usually you would give them 30 days to respond. If they don't respond... Uh, I don't think it falls under the Fair Foreclosure Act, which allows 45 days, uh, but I would have to check procedure on that. That's why it's good to have an attorney. Uh, after you file a notice and they haven't responded, you will file a complaint. Uh, in the complaint, that will set up who has an interest in the property, who's going to be served. One of the great things about a uh, tax sale certificate foreclosure is it has priority over everything. Uh, and, and uh, you know, basically, I mean everything. Federal tax liens, institutional mortgages, um, maybe even old mortgages that are out there that haven't been uh, discharged of the record that could be a problem with title. So to me, when a tax sale foreclosure is done right and it's at the end, it's like the cleanest piece of property you can possibly have. Even though there is a right of redemption, and we'll get into that later, it's, um, I, I think it's a beautiful animal. So what you do is, before you file your complaint, you really do a search on the property, and you want to cover 20 years. Uh, the reason that we say 20 years is because judgments uh, in the state of New Jersey are good for 20 years. So you want whoever was entitled for those 20 years to be run to make sure that there's no tax judgments that might be questionable. Um, and you can cut out interest of the state of New Jersey. You can cut out interest of the United States of America, uh, any institutional lien, anything, even prior tax sales. Um, the only thing that you can't cut out is if there's a uh, lien that came after you. Um, you, you would have to uh, deal with that. And... Um, you know, that's something that you have to take care of. Um, so once you file your complaint and you get all your ducks in a row, so to speak, where you have uh, the owner of the property, the institutional mortgage, any judgments, any back title, um, what you will do then is you file your complaint. It lists everybody that's going to be included. Then you file a notice of list pendant. The notice of list pendant gets filed in the county. The complaint gets filed with the state where they set a docket. Um, the one thing you have to remember is if it is a judgment against the United States of America, such as a federal lien against the owner of the property, you can't set a time, place, and amount type of uh, foreclosure. You have to go to a judicial foreclosure, which you're going to need to deal with the sheriff, and there will be a sheriff sale. Um, only if the United States of America is included. Um, if not, we can go the other way. Um, so you file your complaint with the state and you get your docket number. Um, this way, if you do have to go to the uh, sheriff's seat, you have a docket going with the state. Plus, it's up there for us to look at later. Uh, you file your notice of list pendants, which gets filed in the county. That's like notice to the world that we're going to foreclose this thing. Um, so everybody knows about it. Any of the judgment creditors can see it, although they don't have the right to come in and bid on it, which is interesting. Um, and then uh, after all your service is completed and everybody's done, uh, you, you have your notice of sale where you tell everybody that, okay, we're going to have a sale, um, and this is the time we're going to have it, this is the place we're going to have it, and this is the amount we're looking for. 
Okay? It's kind of very similar to the notice that the tax uh, collector puts out in the legal advertisements that says, you know, on November 9th, uh, uh, 2012, at 10 a.m., uh, in the North Municipal County Chambers of City Hall, gives you the address that we will have a sale for the lien against XYZ for this certificate. Um, the only people who are allowed to come to that sale and purchase it is the owner of the property and anybody with an institutional lien. So, first mortgage holder like Chase, okay? Um, they're the ones who can redeem the certificate. If they come and redeem the certificate, they're going to pay you the amount that's due and you're going to discharge that certificate. And, you know, the first, the, the bank might pay it because it's their interest to pay it. Uh, to protect their mortgage. They don't want to lose out their money, which they would lose out and have to go against the owner. Um, so um, that's it. Anybody else is just out of luck. I mean, there's, there's been kind of scams where people have tried to purchase the property from the owner to come in and buy the certificate and uh, try to outskirt things. If we see something like that, we wouldn't insure it. And, and so... Uh, you need to be careful and pay attention to what's going on as well because you know who the owner is because you've done your due diligence. And if, if it's been a quick sale out and nothing's been paid off and this guy is just like trying to skate in and cut out the mortgage company um, by buying judgment, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, so if no one redeems it, you end up with the property. You get a final judgment that says now you, you own the property. Um, once you own the property, at this point, the owner still has three months to come back and redeem the certificate. Okay, so for three months, you're really going to be sitting with it again, uh, not wanting to do anything with it until you know that this person is not going to come back. Uh, that can be extended to a year. Um, it gets extended to a, a year. Um, only if there's bad service to the owner. So if uh, John Jones owns the property and your your uh, servicer goes up and goes to John Jones' house and hands it in and it gets signed by John Jones' wife, uh, John Jones can say, like, I don't know what the heck happened. You know, that was my wife. She never gave it to me. She don't like me anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, and hopefully that's not the case, but... Um, Personal service against them personally prevents them from coming forward and saying, I didn't know about it. And that's where that one-year right of redemption falls in. That's, that's for the people who were noticed by uh, mail so that they got a certified letter. Maybe they signed for it. Maybe they didn't. They got regular mail sent to their house. No personal service. Um, they couldn't find the person, so they put a legal notice in the paper saying, we're foreclosing you, and this is what's going to happen. After 60 days, you get a, a default that allows you to move forward with your judgment, so you can um, go forward with it. But um, the three months is like that's in solid. So once you get your foreclosure, you get your final judgment, record it, wait your three months, you then start doing whatever you want to do on it. Um, the uh, problem with the one year is like you know, you're an investor, you're trying to, you know, dump the property is quickly as you can. Uh, most title companies will not pass on the one-year right, regardless of what goes on. Uh, as far as I know, uh, with my expertise in this, my underwriters will allow me to ensure over that one-year redemption, providing I'm satisfied with the way the service is. Um, we've had cases where um, there's an interesting story. Uh, Foreclosure went through. I get a call from one of the foreclosure attorneys who says, this guy is buying the property. We went to a title company. Um, the one year is up, but they have a question on, on, on the title of what's going on. Um, it came through an estate, and they're questioning the estate, and they're not sure if everybody was named, so they asked me to take a look at it. When I looked at it, I found that... Uh, the grandmother owned the property. When she passed away, she gave it to the son. So everything was in, in the state. And then the son passed away. And nobody found the son's estate. 
And so they questioned as to who really owned it and the service was against the right of the state. So they, they really did not want to, like, deal with this property at all. I did some due diligence looking up. I found the son's estate. In the son's estate, I found that his sister was his only surviving heir. Um, so I tracked the sister down, found out that she passed away, and she had left two sons. Looking back through the estate, I got to the grandmother's estate, which named the two sons that was that gave me the names of the two sons of the daughter to her estate because uh, they they were in there for another reason. And I ended up googling and finding one of the sons to uh, who lived out in Monmouth County. I made a phone call and said, uh, you know, is your mother's name Jeanette? And he's like, yeah. I said, well, did you have an uncle, Uncle Max in North? And he's like, oh, yeah, Uncle Max's place. I said, well, it was a tax sale foreclosure on this. And they didn't seem to get all the interest out, and they were worried about it. And uh, I offered him to buy the property back. Um, I said that the judgment on the property was $50,000. So if you really want it, we can, we can vacate the judgment, and you can have the property for $50,000. You and your brother, because you end up being the sole heirs. Um, they talked it over and decided not to do it, and uh, I prepared two deeds from both of the brothers into the uh, plaintiff who took the property by final judgment and eliminated any questions about any estate, anything going on, and made sure that the title was clean. But you can see through that little story that sometimes even doing your due diligence, if certain things aren't picked up, there's going to be questions. If there's a question, insurers will not insure, uh, which makes it difficult for you to sell the property. You can own the property, you can rent it, you can do what you want with it, but trying to mortgage it or sell it would be quite a difficulty um, if there's an interest out there. Um, I, I think, you know, to most of it, that's uh, about where it would uh, kind of end. Um, you do have to be careful. I, I, I actually have one now that um, the owner didn't redeem the property, but he put in for an order to stay the sale, which had already taken place. Why he's not coming over for full redemption, I don't know. Um, but what happened is the court turned down his appeal. So the guy wants to sell it. The year is not up. Uh, he has now appealed the appeal. So it's an ongoing case. The guy wants to sell it. Uh, buyer wants me to insure it. And it's like, you cannot insure it. There's a question here. Um, part of the law says that if they come back and contest, and go to the court, and they lose as far as the owner being they, because uh, they're trying to stop it and get it back. And they've lost their right of redemption because the courts have decided that they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, that right of redemption gets completely wiped out once the court decides that they're losing their case because they came back for it. So you, you need to um, just make sure everything's, you know, all your ducks are in a row and you're in a good shape. Um, I think that kind of like wraps it up. I, I guess I can answer any questions now, uh, Jared, if you want to. Sure, we can uh, field some questions. Yeah. Anyone anyone that does have a question, there's two ways you can do it. You can chat it into the chat box or the question and answer box. Either one will work. We have one that came in uh, during the second half of your presentation. Uh, it's a rather long one, so uh, just bear with me for one second. It is. Uh, so just to clarify, do you mean that a tax sale certificate has first lien position and you can file a foreclosure if there, even if there is a, hold on, even if there is an open purchase mortgage, the expectation will then be that the mortgage company will redeem so as not to lose out on its own investment? In effect, if no other lien holders include mortgage, including the mortgage company, does not seem to redeem your does not redeem your tax sale, then they no longer have the property as a collateral. Correct. So if uh, I buy the property, I get to purchase my mortgage. Um, 
for the majority of the time, the, the mortgage company will pay the taxes just to make sure that, uh, and it's usually built into your mortgage payment. But, you know, there are those companies out there that, you know, or the people who do not want any, uh, taxes escrowed in their mortgage, so they pay them separately. Um, and yes, if they go into a tax sale, and I purchase that tax sale, and it's after the purchase money mortgage, um, yeah, I have priority over that mortgage. Uh, my foreclosure allows the mortgage company to come and redeem the certificate from me, and if they do not, then I own the property. Once my final judgment is done and no one's redeemed it, um, that property is mine, subject to the one-year right of redemption uh, by the owner only, not by the bank. Uh, and I hope that answers your question. Okay. So the next question, for the most part, do owners come back to pay the taxes before foreclosure? Um, from what I've, I've seen, there are companies that go out there and buy all these little tax sales, and I'm sure that people do redeem them. Um, I don't, I'm not overrun with uh, tax sale foreclosures as far as final judgments being sold. Uh, I would say I probably do about um, maybe 10 a month that would uh, go into a sale, uh, into final judgment, and they would get them back. But for the most part, the smaller ones are all the pay off. The next, how long does the tax certificate foreclosure process take? Um, about six months. That's, uh, from the time of your notice to the... Uh, Time of setting your place in the mount. Okay. You have uh, about 45 days on your notice of intention, and 30 to 60 days with your service, and another uh, 45 days of notice of sale. And then it would depend on uh, where it's scheduled at and whether or not it's going to be a sheriff sale. If the U.S. is in, it's going to take a little longer. But time, place, and amount within six months, you should be able to redeem your property. And attendee wants to know, are you familiar with any computer programs which help uh, tax sales certificate investors manage subsequent tax payments? No. I have no idea how they manage that. I'm okay. sure that's something they would set up with the county. Do you have to sell the tax lien certificate to the mortgage company if they have a lien on the property? Do I have to sell the tax sale certificate to the mortgage company? No, I don't sell the tax sale certificate. But if the mortgage company comes in and wants to pay it off, yes, they're going to pay me for whatever money I've expelled plus whatever interest is owed to me. So if, they're, if they know about the lien and the mortgage company wants to come and pay it prior to um, you... Uh, for closing on it, then, uh, yes, they can redeem it. Can you sell it? Yes. You can also sell your tax sale certificate. You can assign them to someone else. So if another company wants to come in and buy your tax sale certificate for you, yes, they can buy it. How much would they buy it for? They would buy it for the amount that you put out plus whatever interest you were getting on it. Is the tax sale certificate process the same process in all states? Um, each state, there will be a variation, so you'll need to check each state. But basically, uh, you know, the, the laws of the United States run all the way through uh, for real estate, and, and it's basically pretty similar in almost every state. What are the consequences of owning a tax sale certificate where there is a foreclosure by the bank? The bank cannot foreclose your tax sale certificate. You have priority over everything. So if the <laughs> bank is foreclosing it, the bank will pay you. <laughs> <laughs> so your minimum rate of return is the interest rate that you bid on at the original sale. Right. And if you know everything goes through, your rate of return will be the value of the property that you acquire. At the end, depending right. on how it goes. Pretty bad. Wonderful, and that uh, was Nicole Clack, who is the Vice President of Fortune <laughs> Title Agency. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't introduce you earlier. Uh, she's also she's also on here. Um, 
the next question, are there any easier ways to find attractive liens to buy other than uh, going through the newspapers? Um, no, go through the newspaper or contact the tax collectors. And if you're interested in this particular town, you can contact the tax collector and see if there's uh, any taxes coming up for sale. But, uh, you know, it's all notice. Wonderful. Okay, so when does the 18% start to accrue? Uh, and what if the lien is redeemed within a month? What is the return, assuming the purchase is for 18%? Well, my guess would be that the 18% um, is for the year, so um, whatever would break down to the month would be where you would be at. Uh, I'm not a math genius on it. <laughs> we have a lot of questions coming in. This is fantastic. Uh, the next one, we've recently heard that they are now selling tax sale certificates in New Jersey which is where we're both Fortune Title and, um, and Next Generation are located. Is this true online? They are now selling tax sale certificates online. We're selling tax sale certificates online? Uh, I, I, that I don't know. Uh, I can't okay. answer that. All, all I know is that uh, it would be nice if they were. Maybe they're just noticing them online. I, uh, maybe they're putting their notice online, where it's uh, like this one for the city of Newark with the, you know, almost 2,000 properties that are there, it's a possibility that they're putting the tax liens online, showing you what they are, um, and giving you the time, place, and the amount. But you're not going to have a bidding. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe they would do any bidding online for you to purchase them. One more question. I noticed from payment listings in newspapers that some of the properties owe on sewer and water, but not on taxes. How is that? Uh, the sewer and water bills come separately, um, depending on the township. Sometimes they're combined together, sometimes they're not. Sometimes the water is private, uh, and what happens with the private company is uh, you pay them. If, if you don't pay them, uh, they'll pursue it. If they don't get anywhere, they'll turn it over to the town to put it on a lien for tax sale. So the possibility is that, yes, they're paying their taxes, but the water and sewer is not included because that's a separate bill. So that's where they will sell them as well. Wonderful. We'll give another minute for any questions, but, Nicholas, do you want to pass along your contact information just in case anyone wants to follow up? Yeah, you know, uh, the best way to get me would, would be you can go to my website, which is fortunetitle.net, and uh, there, there uh, is an Ask Nick uh, button there if you have any questions. Uh, you know, uh, you, you won't get an answer immediately, but uh, I'll be notified, and then I can address it. Wonderful. One more question did come in. Can you buy tax lien certificates through your IRA? And I love that question, Nick. I'll actually take that one. Yes, <laughs> yes, you can. You <laughs> That's, a, that's why we're working together here. You certainly can purchase tax lien certificates through your uh, retirement plan. You would set up an account with a self-directed IRA administrator or custodian like Next Generation Trust Services. Basically, how it would work is we would move your funds into your IRA account that you set up to say through us. Uh, at the time you're looking to go to any auctions, we would send you a check. Um, that you can bring to the to the auction uh, listed in the in the name of the township, and we can actually send you several checks for um, different amounts of money. And anything you use, great, they can you can send it. Uh, you can use that, and anything you don't use will come directly back to us to be put into your account. And, and just a note on that. Um, all successful bids uh, purchases must be made by bank certified funds, uh, which is defined as money orders, cash, debit, credit cards. And all successful bids must be paid up, uh, in full upon closing of the bid in the office of the tax collector. Uh, they usually no partial payments will be accepted. So uh, just remember that when you're going, that you need an appointment to pay for everything. 
Yep, and we, and we certainly work with the investors uh, on giving them what they need. Uh, certainly, you're not going to know how much you're going to to bid going into the um, going into the event. So usually, we do um, just uh, an example. We give if you're looking to spend about ten ten thousand dollars, we would give maybe ten one thousand dollar check uh, cashier's check to you in the name of uh, the township that you're going to. Anything you don't use will be sent back to your IRA account here and will go directly to your IRA account. Right. And, and, and you know, when you look at and find out what properties are there, like if you look at the start of it, it tells you the total amount too. So you have a good idea of what you're looking to spend. You know, so you, you should be able to bring something pretty close to what you have. Wonderful. Any follow-up questions on that? No, and it looks like we're finished for today. Uh, again, if you have any questions at all or, or didn't get Nicholas's contact information, please call the office at Next Generation Trust Services and speak with me. The number here is 973-533-1880. The email address info, that's I-N-F-O at nextgenerationtrust.com. Thank you so much for attending. We hope you learned a lot. Any follow-up questions, let me know. And uh, thanks for everything, Nick and Nicole. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, if you Google Fortune title, you'll find us. Thank you. Wonderful.